Listen to the Vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I'm very happy to welcome Dick Weibrow here. Now, he is an author, but he's got quite an interesting story to tell. And I'm going to let him just start things off. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am currently living in um, Auckland, New Zealand, um, which is an odd path, I suppose. Or maybe not an odd path. Uh, born in Canada, grew up in the United States. So since I was nine years old, I've always been a bit of an outsider. I've always been somebody who didn't necessarily fit in with everyone else. And I guess that's something that ended up in large part um, encouraging some of the storytelling. Um, but yeah, I've, I've done um, I've done radio, I've done television, I've done stand up. On the TV side, I ain't pretty enough to be in front of the camera, so I'm producing pretty people. Um, but in the, in the other instances, uh, it was me on the mic. So um, I've like a lot of authors you'll hear. I've been writing since I was my um <laughs> everyone's got there i've been writing since but uh i've really only started to hammer into it harder in the last uh five seven years or so and so i've got a couple series doing really well um basically uh for anybody tuning in who doesn't know my name which is probably most of you um um i write humor stories because that's what i love um but i usually use some form of supernatural because i find that it just gives me the space to create scenarios and opportunities for for emotion and some fun. So that's what I do. So did you walk away from the uh, radio world to become an author? No, um, I did. <laughs> so uh, when I was 19 or 20, um, I did stand-up comedy mm -hmm. uh, for about three, four years. And I've, I've not, if nothing else, I think I've always had a bit of a like that, is coming and so uh this was about in the early mid 90s or so and then stand -up comedy was huge i mean you'd be playing these and i was just an opener and then a middler which is the feature act for headliners um and you would just you'd be in these these theaters man and it was like being in like in a roman coliseum and there's just people like up around you it's like oh you want to entertain and it was just this flow of love coming at you it was just the greatest um but because of commercial entities, of course, um, television went, wait a minute. So I could barely pay people, put up a brick wall, put a microphone in front of them, and people will watch that on my channel. And then so suddenly, and I don't know if you remember this, Kyle, but then suddenly you had A&E had a comedy night. Obviously, there was Comedy Central doing short sketches. Every every network was putting up comedy shows and slowly slowly that began to erode crowds coming into the theater so i myself was like uh, i could see that coming and so i was like i need to find another job that isn't really a job <laughs> so i was like let's do this but then sit down instead of standing up and so i got into radio and i did that for about a dozen years and the same thing started rolling, you know, um, in the early 2000s or so, you could see radio being um, grabbed up by all these big corporations and conglomerates. You got a guy from St. Louis doing a live local show in Dallas. And it's like, people can hear that, you know, they know when they're being jobbed. And slowly people started fading away from radio. Uh, and that was also sort of a bit around the time uh, when uh, the rise of podcasts and that. So I did radio for about 10 years or so. And I was like, this ain't going to work. And I got my way to television. And I've been doing that sort of as a day gig uh, ever since for the last 20 years almost. Um, but then now trying to make, as I see television fading, uh, trying to make my transition into the writing. And it's been going really, really well. I used to just listen to the morning radio because I like to hear them joking around and they would do practical jokes and all kinds of yep. stuff like that. And the afternoon crews were a little more uh, just boring. <laughs> Give you maybe a quick snippet of news or something. And then here's the song. And it was usually the same eight songs over and over and over again each day. So yeah, uh, a streaming service come along. Plug yeah. it into your car and you just listen to whatever you want to all day long. I th I think it's like, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's like anything in sort of the creative realm, right? With radio, um, a little bit like writing, it should seem effortless. Like a lot of people would say, oh, I like to talk. I should be on the radio. There's so much craft involved that you don't see. Mm -hmm. You know, you only see the surf and it just sounds like a bunch of folks sitting there joking around in that. But there is 
you, you know, it's on the radio. So we would be writing on whiteboards, passing stuff back and forth, hand signals. You know, you're coming in, I'm coming in. And then you get onto somebody else's rhythm. There's also a bit of an arc of how you tell a story on the radio. Um, you know, don't wander all over the place. Stay on a line. If somebody says something, don't go off on another tangent. Um, follow what they're doing and support what they've said. And the next person grabs that. And so all of that is under the hood. And that's what makes a good radio show. So, so when you're listening to that, you should just hear people talking. But there are so many mechanics. There are years of mechanics to make three people, four people, two people, one person sitting in a room make three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes of airtime sound effortless and fun. That takes years and years and years to do. And so you're talking about those afternoon shows. Those are usually some of the, I don't see lesser talent, just lesser experienced talent. They haven't quite honed those skills yet. And in today's market, I don't know if they ever will. So um, so thank God for podcasts, because I do feel as a podcast is what radio should be. Well, I won't stay on the subject too long, but I had a buddy of mine whose brother was a DJ at a radio station in Houston. And we went up there and, and just to check it out. And, and he showed me how you record, say, a, a telephone conversation that's going to play on the radio, but you have to be right. quick to edit it and then play it when, you know, it comes time to to play it and to see him do all that stuff. I'm like, I, I don't think I'd ever learn that. When I started, this is how old I am. When I started, it was real to real. We didn't have digital editing. Mm -hmm. So our editing was on tape. And the way to do that is you had to listen to one ear while the music is playing. You've just taken your phone call that you're going to play back on, on, on the radio. And you're slicing and cutting and taping and making marks with grease pencils. And you got to do all that in about two and a half minutes to get that. And then cue it back up and get that on the air. So you had razor blades all over the place. It looked like a like you were a Coke freak or something like that. I had gone through <laughs> razor blades. All. And, but, you know, yeah, that skill was great. You learned, It taught you how to think fast. It taught you how to edit, to be honest. Um, uh, and it's something that even today I can arc into with some of my writing, you know, where are the words that need to come out? What, is, how do I get into this quickly uh, where I can grip somebody and move, move through the story? And how many books have you written? I've written, I think, 10 or 11. It's hard. Wow. Um, I've got one series right now, which is Hell Lake. The new one, which is doing very well, um, you can see behind me on the wall, is Kane. Um, and that is... Um, I'm writing a third book right now, and I'm on a bit of a rapid release uh, schedule, uh, which means there is less sleep than I normally get. Um, but I think altogether, there was a couple, there was a buddy of mine, Brad Belzer, who's uh, another author, um, and I don't even know if there are Kinkos left in America because I haven't been there for about 10 years. But uh, he used to say, my first couple of books were published by Kinkos, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> which is, you know, you're going to write a couple of books that frankly suck and should make the, the light of day. And, and the same was me. I probably wrote three or four that never made it anywhere. And that's a lot of writing. Those, that's, you know, 500,000 words or so that never got published. Uh, so now, like I said, I've got the two series um, and they sort of there's some there may be some crossover. I haven't decided yet. But right now it's just basically Kane doing his thing, uh, which is basically uh, a reverse werewolf story, which I'm really enjoying writing. Yeah, I've read a little bit. <laughs> it's like, what was this guy thinking when he wrote this? <laughs> yeah. But you have a comedic mind. And Thank you. So all your writing is on the paranormal side? Uh, you know, it, not all of it. <clears throat> um, I have written one that was a straight-up thriller, but I can't get away from the humor. There's still going to be humor, dark humor throughout that. I just kind of like that world because it allows you opportunities. The fun part of Kane, the feedback I get from readers, is they sort of like, and this is a little bit of like how it got into my head, this idea like, okay, so this was a wolf. Cain was a wolf who got bit by a man, an infected man, and then turned into a human. So kind of a reverse werewolf story in a way. Uh, he does turn into, the moon does affect him and he changes. <clears throat> but sort of the fun part for me, and apparently it turned out for readers, which is often the case. If you're having fun with something as a creator, then people are enjoying it as well. Um, but the fun part is how would a, an animal, a wolf, look at our world through human eyes? 
And so that's, that's the fun. And so that, and so that sort of supernatural world allows me to do that. It allows me to have fun with that character, how he sees things, interpret things. And it allows me to use some of that stand up comedy sort of background to do a bit of observational moments, you know, um, <clears throat> there's, there's a moment, a couple of people brought up to me, they was such a small line, but a number of people brought it up to me where, um, where Kane and his partner Amelda are coming into this car show near the beginning of the book. And he's <laughs> Kane used to be a wolf, but now he's a six foot seven French Canadian, of course. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so he, he he's he's coming in. He's never been to a car show before. He's looking at, you know, this sea of cars and they come up to the ticketing booth. And and he says something very Kane like, you know, like I am wolf or something like that. And Imelda, who is his partner, says, don't mind him. He's French Canadian. And the woman behind the ticketing booth goes, oh, well, we love when people from overseas come in. <laughs> and it's and it, it's just, you know what I mean? It's just those moments. It's just those small moments that you can kind of put throughout the story. Not, you know, not set up and punchline, not forced humor, because there's nothing worse. I mean, for me, than reading somebody who who says, this moment is funny, you need to laugh. Like, I'm reading something right now of an author I really do like, and every time somebody says something marginally funny, the characters double over with laughter, and they can't even breathe. And I'm sitting there going like, yeah, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't like to broadcast in any of my stuff. So that's why it's kind of a dry, dark humor. I don't like to broadcast, this is a funny moment. If you find it funny, great. If you don't, it's, it's just a fun moment. And he doesn't just change into a human. No, uh, no. So, and I don't want to give too much away, um, but I don't think it does give too much away. Um, so Kane is affected by the moonlight. Um, so he, as Wolf turned into human, when the full moon comes out, he does turn into this beast, right? He does turn into what I call the wolf wear, because wear as actually means man or human. So um a werewolf is a human wolf and so he's reverse he's wolf human so he's a wolf wear but i also was thinking to myself and this is like you mentioned a moment ago the idea of the supernatural world allowing sort of some of the fun it i was thinking to myself i was like why just the full moon why would it i mean it's still light from the moon why wouldn't it be other times so i started to think if he turns into sort of this wolf wear when there's a full moon what might he turn into when there's a half moon or a quarter moon or a, just like a sliver. And I don't know if it's ever been done before. I mean, everything has been done. But in my mind, I thought, what if he turned into lesser wolves? And of course, that came to mind. What if he turned into dogs? So, <laughs> so if there's a little sliver of a moon, he turns into a little pug. <laughs> if he turns into, uh, you know, if, if there's a bit of a half moon, another dog and... Um, I just don't want to give away too much, but as the moon begins fuller and fuller, he does become larger and larger, more powerful dogs. And so, and so that's been a lot of fun to do. It's, uh, it's the opportunity for me to, um, to play around with my love of dogs. We've got, uh, we've got a dog at home. And so he inspires me, uh, in some of the writing. Um, and so I try and channel some of what he does and what he might think about, I don't know, uh, into the stories. And what's fun is, and again, I don't want to give too much away, but I don't think it does, is as the character grows through the story, if you're a dog owner, you know all dogs have certain personalities. And many dogs, breeds, have certain traits. Like everybody knows golden retrievers are sweet and they're comforting and they're literally therapy dogs. So when Kane turns into particular animals, he actually holds on a little bit of the essence of that animal. So as the story progresses and he turns to these various dogs and the wolf wear at some points, but as he turns into these dogs, he gets sort of challenged and troubled and confused by how some of these other traits are coming in and how it's changing him as a human. Um, so no, it's, it's, it's a fun story. Uh, it's a fun story to write. And, and to be honest, the way I write, I'm as much a reader as anybody else, because as these characters start to tell me the story and I transcribe it, I'm basically the first reader and I'm enjoying it. I'm having a lot of fun with it. When did you first get interested in the supernatural? I think I've always sort of been interested. I think I got interested in the creative side. Like um, 
um, I sort of joke that many years ago, when I was like seven or eight, my father gave me my, my first book, The Wind in the Willows, uh, which put me off reading for about two, three years. <laughs> very dense, very, you know, very cerebral. And I stumbled across Douglas Adams, Hitch Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, when I was about 13 or 14 years old. And and that's science fiction, but it's also not science fiction. You know, it, he's using science fiction as a vehicle to tell the story, not somebody who loves science fiction so much he wants to get into all the nitty gritty. And so that was sort of the first time reading Hitchhiker's Guide of the Galaxy where I went, oh, wait a minute. There are no rules. You can do anything. You can do anything. And and that was an awakening for me. And so some of the supernatural interest that I had was knowing that that um, construct would allow me to create stories where I could create. Now, there will be rules. You got to stick within a line, but you stick down that line because it makes storytelling better, not because you're constricted. Um, so the supernatural interest that I have, and I do have various supernatural interests, but the supernatural interest I have is loving that universe and being able to live in that universe where anything can happen and anyone can be a hero. So you made all this up on your own or did you kind of go back and research cryptids and things like that? I will confess to you that I've maybe read three monster books in my entire life. I'm not a huge monster guy i actually my appetites when i read or listen to audiobooks a lot of it is more science fiction like the bobiverse um or expedition force and all this um but um i the interest that i have in in creating supernatural worlds the interest in crafting these characters sort of comes from this interest in the unknown you know what with the possibilities out there what can happen um so no i don't have a, i don't have a lot of a reading background uh when it comes to supernatural well i i'll have to say that is very interesting to go from a wolf to a man and then turn into something like a pug i've never <laughs> read anything like that in my life well, hopefully, and that and that's part of the fun of it. You know, I, I love that side of creativity. One of the things that I have, and um, and I don't know if you can notice, on occasion while I'm speaking, I sort of fade just slightly. And you might have seen it once or twice during this. It happened just about 60 seconds ago. Um, I have narcolepsy, um, which means that I am tired all the time. Um, and it's, it, I don't have like where you pass out. I don't have that thing, cataphylaxy where somebody makes a loud noise and then I go out. But I am always extremely tired and I have to force myself to kind of keep up. But the one advantage that narcolepsy has is, I feel, almost to the point of being a superpower, narcolepsy allows me to stay in a bit of a wake dream state. Do you know when you're lying down in bed? and you're about to fall asleep and you have these thoughts come to your head and you think, wow, that's an interesting idea. I should write that down. I'll remember in the morning. And you don't. I pretty much spend 85% of my time in that state. As a narcoleptic, I'm somebody who's always in that, in that borderlands between wake and sleep. And I think the advantage I have, the, seeing it as a superpower, the advantage I have is that gives me an unusual conduit to creativity that a lot of the people might not and a lot of people might say oh i can't write that that's that's too strange where i'm sort of in the dream wake sleep uh week uh dream wake state i kind of go yeah that makes sense <laughs> so, yeah sure he turns into dogs great let's do that um so that filter doesn't really exist for much as me later on when i'm editing i can tighten stuff together but i really feel the narcolepsy that i have has given me honestly a big advantage over some other writers because i am in a creative state most of my time it's crazy how when you have a dream it makes sense when you're dreaming but then when you right. wake up and you think about it like well, that doesn't make any sense at all now I've, i have heard theories about that where our memories you know we create proteins in the brain every time we access that memory we're actually changing that protein those sort of things but the, the memories that we have are built upon other sensory inputs so that you know on my memory of speaking with you kyle um will be about 
the cat over here eating and then we'll be barfing within the next two minutes um the you know the feeling of uh, the floor against my feet uh, the temperature of the air the problem with dreams and trying to remember dreams sometimes is we don't have that other stimulus we don't have those other bits and pieces coming in so so parts begin to chip away because the brain goes well i don't remember this other stuff and it gets begins to get confused and jumble the pieces around from what i understand of those dream states that the reason that we try and recall it doesn't quite make sense anymore is because we're not getting all the pieces we don't have the other reference material that's attached to it we don't have that sensory information that that roots it into our brain and so then we don't have the ability to really recall it. so it might have been an amazing thing it might have been an amazing idea but then when you wake up and you try to piece it together the, the puzzle's missing pieces and that doesn't really make any sense anymore or maybe it was just stupid <laughs> <laughs> i get plenty of those too i get plenty of dumb dreams well we met on a app called pod match and yep. i watched your video before we uh, we did the interview and i noticed that you did call your condition a superpower yeah now has that been an obstacle for you in the past Oh, sure. Um, in fact, it was funny because years ago I was married to a hypochondriac. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll never forget it because I'm one of those older dudes that, you know, unless my arm's been cut off and there's blood spouting everywhere, I'm like, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Um, and so I don't do the doctor thing so much. But since she was as I said, lovely woman, but she was sick a lot. And she went in one time and spoke to a sleep doctor. And she was like, oh, I think I have this narcolepsy. I have something like this. And so the doctor ended up going through and doing the checklist and all that stuff. And I was just leaning up against the door, um, just sort of waiting for the appointment to end because I'd gone in with her. And I kid you not, he goes, you don't have narcolepsy. But I think he might. And I went, what? And so he was able to see just from my demeanor or how I spoke or something that I might have it. And so I went in and um, you, you do an overnight and they put the electrodes all over your head and you sleep. It looks like a scene from a movie where you have people watching you, you know, there's cameras around um, and they wake you up every couple of hours. They ask you questions, they do readings. But then after that, sure enough, um, they said you have narcolepsy and and whereas a lot of people, it's difficult, you know, it's certainly not difficult as other conditions, but having an idea of what that was, having an idea of why I was so tired was, was uh, empowering is really the only thing I can say. Because when I was younger, my father used to call me lazy. <laughs> uh, he just, you know, he used to take the mower turn it on and put it outside my window at like 11 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday and just let it run. It's like, I apparently that's my cue to get up and mow on, but I would sleep a lot. And he would tease me about me having growth, growth spurts. I'm five foot eight. <laughs> I didn't have any growth spurts, but so that sort of, it is, it was like teasing, but that sort of teasing, I was growing up at this idea that you're sleeping all the time. And then the feeling as I got older, of always being tired. And I admit to you, I had one year where my best friend's friend was a Coke dealer and I ended up doing coke for about a year. And I remember going like, is this being awake? Is this? Now, part of it was the coke buzz, which I don't recommend, obviously. But that was kind of the first time where I was like, I don't feel tired. And that is amazing. I, it wasn't even sort of the buzz off the drug. It was just not being tired. That was the first time in my life I realized that I'm not tired. This is what it feels like, not being tired. Um, and so... So it took many years even after that to be able to recognize this idea that I have narcolepsy. I take medicine for it. Um, I do a little bit of coffee, um, not as much as you think, um, but because I, there's a big crash on the other side. But I do feel, as, oh, as I said a moment ago, that even though it's a condition that makes you feel tired and sometimes angry and exhausted and frustrated, knowing that it's narcolepsy, knowing that that's what it does to me, I can sort of mitigate that and not put that onto other people. Because I think in the past that when I would get tired and I would get angry, I would lash out a little bit. Not terribly so. Not wolfware why? <laughs> not wolfware style. <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> um, but but uh, but no. Now that I know what it is, and now that I know that it's coming, and that I have people around me that support me, which is one of the greatest things in the world to be able to tell people this. Because I'm a Canadian. 
by birth. And our goal is to never, ever burden other people or inconvenience other people in any way whatsoever. And so the idea of telling people is the American side of me, where I just share myself. Americans have an amazing way of just saying, hey, this is who I am. This is what I is. And if you don't like it, then screw you. And I love that. And, and I have I've brought that in. And so over the last 10 years or so, I have said to people, I have narcolepsy. And this is the way it is. And sometimes I'll get like this. You just need to know that. And it's not making an excuse. But if you see me fade away or get tired or walk away from this conversation, just because I just can't be here anymore. And people, it's great. People really seem to drink that in and understand that. Um, so so learning how to, to, to manage that and then using, as I said, using that narcolepsy, turning it around, taking that disease or condition and using using it to my benefit as a writer has been one of the most empowering things in the world for me. And it's created a book that is currently right now a bestseller on Amazon. And so, but I want to not have narcolepsy I'll be honest, I can't answer that question because I like the creativity. I like being in the, I, I wish I wasn't so tired all the time, but I like being in this dream state world because I have all these friends that I can tell people about. Has that been the biggest obstacle in your life? Um, I think the biggest obstacle in my life has, as raised in America or raised in Canada, my biggest obstacle is learning to find myself, learning to become confident in myself, because we spend so much time worrying about what other people say. We spend so much time about how somebody else might interpret what we're doing. You know, there's sort of an old line um, about like the the greatest way, the best way to be cool is just to not care about being cool. You know, if you try to be cool, you're not going to be. But if you just go, screw it, you end up being kind of cool, actually, that way. <clears throat> and so with that sort of framework, it's the same thing when it comes to other people. I was always so worried about how somebody might interpret what I might say. I was always so worried about how somebody might view what I'm doing. And the moment I sort of found a bit of a sense of self and sure of who I was, and that does take years. And I think that's the most important thing, especially for a young person. You ain't going to work this out when you're 20. You're not going to work out when you're 22. And allow yourself those mistakes. I learned so much from my mistakes. I, you don't learn anything. I haven't learned anything from success. I learned from falling down and smashing myself around. And to the point where I now welcome those moments when I fall down, because I know I seriously, I do, because I go like, great, I've learned something there. I've learned something today about what not to do or how to change things around. And that's helped a lot. Um, because now when I get people around me, and you will have this, we all have this. When I get people around me, that take chips out of me, right? When I take people, when I get around people that try and take jet, and you always have this your entire life. It doesn't matter what level of success you have. And I have people around me that love taking jabs, love making slights, you know, even today. I now take that. I use that. I use that as a, I use that as inspiration. When I'm lying there in the morning thinking, oh, I don't want to get up and write. I, I remember what some of those people say about this. I remember what this person said about something I've done or something, you know, I've created. And I go like, I'm going to prove you wrong. That I take that negativity that they have spewed at me <clears throat> and I use that as fuel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't let it seep into me, but I take those words they say, that negativity they try and cut me down with, because that's what they're trying to do. When they're shooting negativity at you, it's not about you. It's about them. It's about them trying to lift themselves up by pushing you down. That's not about me. It's about them. But I take those words they say, and those words get my ass out of bed at 3.30 in the morning. No joke. 3.30 in the morning to write for four hours before I go do my TV work. And that that took a long time to get into my head. Because for the longest time, I let that sink in and hurt me. Um, but I have come to the point now, as I say, that I know, well, go ahead and say that. Because you know what? That shitty thing you just said to me, sorry about that. That crappy thing you just said to me, I'm going to take that. That's going to get my butt out of bed here tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. I can relate. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love it when somebody leaves a nice comment on my podcast. But when somebody comes on and calls me names and you know says how terrible i am all those other things i find it empowering myself it just motivates me to, to keep yep. going and it's tough because because for younger people and you and i both were younger people some decades ago for younger people it can be so disheartening it can be so crushing but if 
if, if you need if you need to hear it, you're great. If you're if you're watching this right now, if you're watching Kyle right now, if you're, if you're listening to me right now, just know this: you're great. You you can do anything at all. And and when people start to see that, it makes them nervous. When people start to see you rise up, it makes them nervous because you're rising up a little higher and they're not. And so you will find people around you, sometimes even people that you thought were friends, that will start to take chips away at that. They'll start to take chips away at that. And as you're saying, Kyle, and as I'm trying to say. Just know that you're great and know you can do great things if that's what you want to do. You don't have to, but if you want to do some great things, use that as your fuel. That will get you motivated. That will be your rocket fuel to push harder next time. Well, thank you, Hoser. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the Great White North reference. I love that. <laughs> do, do you have a website? Uh, I do. It's just my name, dickwybro.com. Um, and uh, Kane, the series out is on Amazon. It's actually also in bookstores, the paperback. You can find it in Walmart and Barnes & Noble, other places, usually online. But it wouldn't be so bad if you went and asked for it in person uh, to start sucking on the shelves. Um, but yeah, head to my website, dickwybrow.com. All my information is there. And what about your social media? Yep. Uh, I've got, uh, unbelievably, I've got a TikTok. Um, I spent a bit of time on my Facebook. Um, you can see there'll be links for that. Um, I think it's just our Dick Wybrow on Facebook. But just google around on me on any of those I've instagram i spend uh, quite a bit more time as an older person on facebook i am mucking around with tiktok more and more and i've got a couple thousand followers there now i think that's a completely different world but uh but i'm enjoying it and having some fun with it it's uh it's it's so satisfying to just meet people from all over the world and get their sort of impressions about what you're doing what i'm doing yeah us old farts we're still kind of stuck on facebook right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's what we're comfortable with we got a rickety old chair sitting there and so we'll stay <laughs> dick thank you so much for coming on the show today i really appreciate it and i will put all the links in the description to make it easier right. for folks to find you right thank you kyle really appreciate it i appreciate everybody uh watching yeah, I want to thank all of you who are watching today. If you are new to the channel, I hope you'll come back, hit that subscribe button. And for my regulars, you guys are awesome because you make it possible for me to do this. Until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.